on Travis in Novato, California on November of uh, September 9th, uh, 2020, talking to Robbie Davis Floyd in Austin, Texas, where there's a thunderstorm going on. We may hear some background noise yes. <laughs> and a terrified quite, dog at your feet. Quite a downpour, but we need it. We've had a drought through August, so this is fantastic. <laughs> Great. Well, I met you uh, 24 years ago at uh, Mount Madonna Center for the, uh, uh, the wonderful um, Mother Friendly yep. Childbirth Initiative. Uh, yep. when we created that was quite the weekend. <laughs> yeah, and uh, I was a total newbie uh, to the field. Jim Prescott had invited me and uh, my work had been in adult wellness. I'd read uh, Continuum Concept and realized that infant wellness was the way to go. But I was, you know, I met all you amazing women there that uh, have created this field. And uh, so I, I want to find out more about you. That meeting was actually the catalyst. You know, we created the Mother Friendly Childbirth Initiative out of that meeting. And I served as the lead editor for it. And um, so I took feedback for months, people calling frantically, begging for last minute word changes, et cetera. <laughs> and we got that done. And then, you know, it got translated into a bunch of languages and it went around the world. And then we started having international people show up at our Kim's conferences and um, demanding that we create an international initiative. And at first we kept saying, no, 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 we've already done the IMFCI, you just take it and use it, adapt it for your countries. And they kept saying, we don't have the resources, we don't have the capacity, and we didn't want to be white colonialist Americans. So we kept saying no, and then finally they convinced us. So we formed a Kim's International Committee, Deborah Pascali Bonaro was the chair. Right. And, um, and out of that arose, then we split off from Kim's and we became IMBCO, the International Mother Baby Childbirth Organization. And we created an initiative called the, um, the Mother, the, I'm, hold on, <clears throat> I'll grab it. <laughs> I can never remember it either. I, I've looked it up. created this initiative, uh -huh. <clears throat> the International Mother Baby Childbirth Initiative, 10 Steps to Optimal Mother Baby Maternity Services. And <clears throat> I was lead editor for this, like I had been for the MFCI. And I took feedback for a year from experts all over the world. And then it narrowed down to our board members and we crafted the final version. And it went out into the world and got translated into a bunch of languages. And a lot of people started implementing it in their smaller facilities and sites and three large hospitals started implementing it. One in Quebec, one in Brazil, and one in Austria. And then FIGO, the International Federation of Obstetrics and Gynecologists, they created their own initiative in 2015 called the FIGO Guidelines to Mother Baby Friendly Birthing Facilities. And we were really bummed because it's like they ripped off half of our initiative and um, but they didn't, they didn't adopt it wholesale because they didn't like what we said about pain relief during labor because we didn't mention pharmacological pain relief. And they had a few other issues. So eventually um, we merged them. FIGO and IMBCO got together and they gave me the job of merging them. So I also served as lead editor for what we have now, which is the, the final culminating amazing product called the International Childbirth Initiative, 12 Steps to Safe and Respectful Mother-Baby Maternity Care. And this is the real deal. This has 12 steps instead of 10, because Figo thought of steps that we hadn't. We had not included a, a step about staff, staff safety and protection nor had we included the step about cost, that, that all facilities should post their costs up front and not take bribes and not you know, have payments under the table and, and cheat people. Mm -hmm. So um, those two steps were added to this. And I, I wordsmithed this by literally taking the IMBCI and the FIGO guidelines apart, piece by sentence by sentence, phrase by phrase, and merging them together with the help of others who provided the references and the principles and stuff. 
And um, so this initiative is now being all of our mother baby networks who had implemented the IMBCI, this one, switched over to the ICI. And our three hospitals did as well. And now we have hundreds of mother baby networks around the world that are implementing the ICI. And several more large hospitals are signing on and we're developing a series of webinars about each step. And um, we've got a whole international community now interested in supporting us. The ICI, this one, has been endorsed by a ton of international organizations like FIGO and the White Ribbon Alliance and the International Pediatric Association and Lamaze and Every Mother Counts and ICEA and DONA. And uh, I think we're close to an endorsement from WHO and uh, UNFPA and USAID. <clears throat> so this is now the big deal. And we're, we're working hard to, to get it you know, out there in the world and to, to start um, certifying hospitals that are, or facilities that are fully implementing the 12 steps. But we have a series of questionnaires to evaluate whether the steps are being implemented or not, questionnaires for practitioners and questionnaires for women. So we're extremely excited because this could really make a difference in the world. Wow, after 25 years, because we were struggling with that back in the late 90s and trying to get that set up. And yeah, so that original chemist meeting, it's a direct chain, a direct yeah. set yeah. of links through, through the initiatives until we finally came up with the ICI. Well, my goal today with this recording is more personal uh, of your history, since your work is, is well documented already and your website. And I just discovered your Wikipedia page, too. I didn't realize uh, you're Casper, Wyoming gal. And yeah. uh, so I want to start with, uh, with your personal history of like, I know you were born in Wyoming, but uh, and there's a little bit about your parentage, but what your experience was like as a young girl and siblings and what influences that led you eventually to doing the work that you're doing. So if we can start back there and uh, work our way through your, your life, uh, I think that's something that probably isn't that well known and what I'm co uh, collecting with the hundreds of pioneers that I'm interviewing. Okay, well, I was born in Castro, Wyoming in 1951. <clears throat> it was a small prairie town at the time, and my dad was in the oil business and had gone there because of the big oil boom in 1949 that started in Wyoming. And uh, he became an, uh, the largest um, in, in independent oil entrepreneur in Wyoming for mm -hmm. quite a long time. And um, um, my mother had had four miscarriages before me, and she had always been in, they had been in Los Angeles before that and in Orange County, and these fancy California doctors, had, she had a lot of nausea during pregnancy, so they put her on bed rest, and she lost four babies. So this time, when she got pregnant, the country doctor, who was the only doctor in that little town of Casper, he said, he said, don't you give in to it. He said, no, you just, you put on, you do your hair and you put on your fancy dress and you go to those parties and you, if you have to vomit, you go vomit and you come right back to the party. He said, rise above it. <laughs> so all, all, my, all of my life, my mother's favorite saying was rise above it. She had a Southern accent, rise above it. <laughs> I almost put that on her gravestone. I <laughs> could just imagine people walking by and seeing a dead corpse rise above it. <laughs> What a, what a uh, heritage to be born into. Yeah. Anyway, I was born by cesarean in, in, at a time when the cesarean rate in the country was like 2% <clears throat> because um, my mother was terrified of labor and my father and the doctor knew that. So he called her into the little hospital for what he said was a routine exam. I was, she was full term with me. And he took my dad aside and he said, look, I can put her to sleep and just take out the baby. And um, don't you think that would be better for her? And he said, absolutely. So they put my mom to sleep. And when she woke up, she had this beautiful, happy, you know, blonde haired, bouncy baby. And that was just perfect for her. And um, when I rebirthed about my cesarean and had the experience, re relived the experience of it, I vividly remember this kind of window opening up and I'm, I, thought, I thought I was supposed to go down, but suddenly I'm looking up at this light 
and there's this face of the doctor leaning over me and said, when you read those, um, if I did the three men shooting star back in the day, um, back in the early 90s, I guess, um, in the rebirth, I saw, you know, I saw his face and he had brown hair and tortoiseshell glasses. And my rational mind said, no, the last time you saw him, he had gray hair and gold glasses. <laughs> and then my rational Oh, no, wait, this would have been years before that. So, of course, he was younger and he had brown hair and tortoiseshell glasses. And my experience at the cesarean was being lifted up into the, the room exploded in applause. Everybody was thrilled because this was, I, my parents were 43 and this was their last chance to have a baby. And so I was welcomed with this great applause and, and happiness. And that's how I remember my, my own cesarean birth. And so um, I had a marvelous childhood growing up in Casper, um, small town. I just want to pause for a second uh, because our viewers may not be aware of this phenomenon that David Chamberlain wrote books about it, that babies do remember birth. And this is, a, this is actually the first example I've heard in these recordings of one. So I just want to mark that as uh, she's not making it up, folks. This is real. Yeah, no, it's real. Stephen and Rima rebirthed me for a couple of hours, and I was really totally able to relive my, my birth experience and to remember every second of it. And it was empowering for me because I was greeted with so much joy. Um, the, the, but the negative impact that it had on me, um, when I met Jane English in an elevator one time, we talked, she had written, written door, Different Doorway, Adventures of the Caesarean Born. And... Um, and I had always had this, all my life, I had this, this feeling of that nature was Disneyland, you know, and it got me in a lot of trouble. Like one time, my husband and I were at this beautiful park in Yugoslavia called Plitvice, and there were these little streams that, these adorable little streams that, you know, went to a pool and then a little waterfall into another little pool and on down. And I wanted to, I decided I was going to slide over the waterfall. It just looked like so much fun, right? And my husband decided to do it first just to check and he came up screaming with this huge gash in his leg because there were uh, stalagmites coming up from inside the waterfall that you couldn't see, sharp as swords. And if he had been a couple inches the other way, it would have pierced him right up through the middle, you know, and maybe killed him. And he came out screaming, you just think nature is Disneyland. You just think it's a big park where every, you know, there's no danger and everything. And I never understood why I had that attitude toward nature until Jane English explained to me that when you're born by cesarean, um, you, you, don't, you don't experience the forces of nature that you do when you're born normally, vaginally. Mm -hmm. you, you, in those contractions, you know, they massage your body as, an inf as, an, as you're coming out. They also teach you what nature is and how powerful it can be. And I never got that experience. So I was lifted from bliss in the womb to bliss in the world with no effort to make that transition. So it took me years to learn how to really work hard because I was used to just being rescued and things just happening. And it took me decades to understand that nature is, you know, can be dangerous and unpredictable. And it's not Disneyland out there. It's, it's, you know, yeah, there's beauty and magic, but there's also tremendous danger. And my cesarean birth precluded me from seeing that until I worked through it and was able to kind of grow up and, and see the reality. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, my partner is also cesarean and, and we're aware of, I've, I've heard various things about uh, how the world is very different when, when you're, uh, pulled out instead of fighting your way out and, uh, um, and, and so topic, now you so you don't have any siblings well on that topic let me just tell you quickly about my daughter's birth uh -huh. she was also born by cesarean um, an unnecessary cesarean as i later discovered um <clears throat> but she did go through labor but then she got rescued at the last minute so she was then programmed that no matter what she did to get herself born or in life, somebody was going to rescue her. But she was a very smart little kid. And when I was pregnant with her brother, Jason, um, she instinctively would crawl up under my nightgown and wrap her legs around my neck and make me pull the nightgown really tight over her head and 
push, she wanted to be born. She would push through to be born. Mm. She did that dozens and dozens of times. And I understood because I had been to the first PANA, which is now APA conference. And I understood that what she was doing was rebirthing herself and program, reprogramming her brain to, to, to tell her that she could push through on her own. Mm. And so she healed her own cesarean birth when she was four by getting reborn, by making me tighten the nightgown around her head and then making, and then her pushing through. And I let her do it as much as she wanted because I understood what she was mm. doing, she was healing her own cesarean birth. Wonderful. So now your your childhood, uh, were you still in Wyoming or you went to yeah, Texas? Yeah, until I was eight, we lived in Wyoming and um, it was magical. Um, sledding down Castro Mountain in the winters, um, running after the ice cream truck um, and the, the steam calliope would come down the street. It was a big red, like a, an organ on a big red. Nobody knows what a calliope is anymore, but it was a, looked like a fire truck only with an organ on it. And it would come, big red thing, and it would come down the street every Friday afternoon playing music, and the ice cream truck would follow it. And all, all of us kids would run out and follow the calliope and the ice cream truck and get ice cream, and it was just fantastic. I went to a, a my school was three blocks away, and I walked there every day. In the winters, um, the guys would shovel the sidewalks, and we kids would be walking through snow that was taller than us, like through these tunnels of snow on the way to school. And um, it was pretty magical. And um, my dad was chairman of the fair board, so he was in charge of all the rodeos. So, um, and he had a ranch and he taught me to ride. Since the time I was little, I was riding in front of him. And then when I was th I'm three, he decides that I can ride on my own. He, he was, had never had a kid before, right? So he puts a three-year-old on her own horse, a my black and white pinto pony called Spot. And he got me a red leather saddle with silver spangles and a red leather bridle to match. And I was in my, you know, cowboy boots and my cowboy hat and I was all cool. <clears throat> and we're trotting along and I'm good with that. And then all of a sudden he decides on my first time on my horse, he, as a, on my own, he suddenly decides it would be good to gallop. So he starts his galloping and my horse just, I mean, I feel, I'm a three-year-old and it's like the ground is just flying by under my under under me and I got terrified and I started screaming and so my horse ran away with me and my dad's horse started bucking well my dad had a, a, a lariat a rope around my horse's neck that he was holding in one hand and he had the reins of his stallion Casanova in the other hand and Casanova's bucking and my horse is running away with me and my and I'm looking at my back at my dad terrified and my dad just goes, hi -ya! And just like that, he sat his horse down on his haunches and he made my horse do a 360 and just stop. And I was like, wow. <laughs> and that's why I love men. I love their strength. I love their, I mean, my, I was so impressed. My dad was my hero just to go, yeah, like that and stop a runaway horse and a bucking stallion and one, you know, collective motion. I was like, Guys are so cool. Men are awesome. Men are amazing. And I've kept that, that impression all my life. <laughs> and have most of your men lived up to the ideal of your dad? Um, Loaded question. Yeah. Um, I still tough. appreciate male strength. But I, the men that I've been with have not been really good at about dealing with their emotions, which is the other, yeah. other part of that. You know, men tend to live in their heads and their genitals and not be so much in their hearts. Yeah. It's a little harder for them because they're, they're um, what do you call it, the corpus callosum yeah. is lower. And so they tend to be either in the right brain or the left brain. And so if they're emotional, they kind of lose it and get very emotional. Whereas, and if they're, and, but mostly they're non emotional and it's harder for them to share emotions. So, um, Whereas women have a broader corpus callosum, so both hemispheres in us activate, you know, kind of simultaneously. So we can be extremely emotional and extremely rational at the same time. Mm -hmm. And so my problems with men have been their inabilities to deal with their emotions. And um, that's, that's been, you know, a challenge in almost every relationship I've had. So then uh, after the, the horse 
uh, uh, did you um, get a lot of writing skills and uh, at an older age and yeah I, I when I so we moved from Casper to San Antonio when I was um, eight and um, I vividly remember I was at summer camp at Sylvania of the Rockies and my parents picked me up and we passed the highway turnoff to Wyoming and I said daddy you missed the turnoff and that's when they said well that's because we're not going to Wyoming we're moving to San Antonio so I cried all the way there and finally fell asleep in the car. And then I remember my dad carrying me in and putting me into a bed. And I woke up in the morning and there I was in this room with rock walls. All our houses in Castor were made of wood and a room with rock walls. And my room had a sliding glass door that opened out onto this huge yard and a swimming pool. Well, nobody mm -hmm. in Castor had swimming pools except mm -hmm. for the country club, you know. And so I was like, oh, well, this isn't so bad. <laughs> I think I can cope with this. <laughs> and then my mom had a friend, a little girl from across the street come over and play with me. So I instantly had a friend. And then they put me in this fancy girls private school, which was what a, quite a transition for a little country prairie town kid. But I eventually adapted and I loved my school at St. Mary's Hall in San Antonio. And um, I loved my school and I loved my teenage years. I loved learning, loved all my classes, was really happy in school. Um, <clears throat> dated some guys, but most of my focus was on my academic work. And it was effortless for me because, you know, again, I didn't learn, to, I did not really learn to work hard until I wrote my first book, Birth of an American Rite of Passage. Even writing the book wasn't that hard. It was when it came to the references. Because I would look up stuff and get all excited and pull out quotes and close the book. And then when it came to do the references, I would need the page numbers. So I had to do all that research all over again. And that's when I finally really learned to work hard. It wasn't until then that, that something was difficult for me. I was class valedictorian, and that came super easy, you know, I think because of my cesarean programming. Anyway, <clears throat> so yeah, I grew up um, in Casper till eight and then San Antonio until I was 18. And then I married young. Um, it was, I got swept off my feet by this guy I met on a European tour my parents sent me on, Russell. And um, <clears throat> he was a senior at Princeton and I was a senior in high school. And he asked me to marry him and it was so romantic and I got swept off my feet and um, I said yes, kind of, probably stupidly and um, we had and then halfway into the I, 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 I was already accepted at Wellesley so I went there for a year and all that time I thought that if I changed my mind I'd have a whole year to do it but I didn't count on the ritual train of the mother and the mother-in-law and the invitations that went out and the church that got reserved and the country club that got reserved for the rehearsal dinner and the St. Anthony Hotel that got reserved for a seated wedding reception dinner of 500 people, you know, and the bridesmaids dresses and all of that. I, I could not get off the train. I knew that I, I shouldn't be marrying him, but I literally could not figure out how to get off the train. Mm -hmm. So we did marry <clears throat> and we, we had four really fun years, but, um, he was, he became an attorney. I finished, we lived in Austin at first and I finished um, my undergraduate degree and, and he graduated from law school at the same time as I graduated from UT with my undergraduate degree. And then um, we moved to Dallas where my dad bought us this big house in Highland Park, the fanciest neighborhood in Dallas. So we were living, we were two kids living in this mansion. We had a speedboat. And we had a blast. We had lots of parties and we'd go out and, and, and get on the water and I'd water ski and with friends. And, uh, but it was for me a very superficial life. We were going to all these dev parties and, and then I was commuting to Austin to get my master's degree and, um, and later my PhD. And um, I would be in Austin where I was living this very heady intellectual life I had hair long enough to sit on at that point. I was drop dead gorgeous, you know, and I'm wearing a halter top and cutoffs in Austin and going to my classes. And then at night, I would go to Texas Monthly, which was a startup magazine at that point. And I would help the, um, I would copy edit for them for free because as a startup, they didn't have money to pay for copy editors. 
So I was living this really heady intellectual life, copy editing these brilliant articles by these brilliant journalists and going to my classes and doing all this reading and learning and growing. And then I'd drive back to Dallas to the country club and you know, pull my suitcase out of the car and go into the ladies' locker room and change into a fancy evening gown with all my jewelry, put my hair up, and go to some really fancy dev party. And it was just a very schizophrenic life. And I felt like I was on a rubber band that was being stretched mm -hmm. between these two poles. And so um, eventually I just, I, I, I said, this, is, this rubber band's going to snap. You know, I can't keep this up. The Dallas life was way too superficial for me, and my real life was in Austin. That was who I really was, going to school and learning and growing and reading and becoming an anthropologist. So I divorced my first husband. We remained really good friends. We still are. We talk at least once or twice every year to keep, keep up with each other. And, um, <clears throat> and I, I went to grad school, and I loved it. I moved to Austin. I lived in an apartment with a friend. Um, I went to Mexico for an entire year. I, I, I went down there to learn Spanish because you, after the divorce, um, I, needed, I needed a change. I needed to do something different. And I was about to re-enroll for my classes for the fall. And then I heard about this language school in Mexico in Cuernavaca that, teaches, that would teach you Spanish. And you had to have a second language for your PhD anyway. And I thought, okay, this is a way of making a lateral move that will allow me to integrate this change in my life, this divorce and my new independence, while learning and growing in a different way, in a different culture, and learning a new language, which also, but, but still working towards my PhD. So I went to Mexico, and it was terrifying to be, to drive, you know, alone to Cuernavaca, get lost on the expressway, which petered out and just ended, I had no idea where I was. You know, terrifying. I finally found I'm asking people and they're giving me all mixed directions. And then finally, I find the language school in Cuernavaca and, um, and everything was great from then on. And I, um, I was in a class with this, uh, this guy from Canada, Pierre, who was going, to, he was already spoke fluent French and English, and he was um, going to work in the Canadian embassy in Mexico City. So he was highly motivated to learn Spanish, and I was determined to keep up with him. It was just the two of us in the class. So we would have like five hours of classes in the morning from eight to two, and then lunch, and then I would study all afternoon. Just like he was learning so fast, and I was like, this guy is not going to beat me. I'm going to learn as fast as he does. <laughs> and so, um, and once I had finally learned Spanish, like once I understood the grammatical system of the language, I could see its structure just laid out in front of me. And it was such a thing of beauty to understand the linguistic structure of a language. And, um, <clears throat> and then for months, um, I, I knew what to say, but it took a long time for the grammatical rule to come out. So I was really slow in conversation until I went on a cruise with my mom. My dad died, and I went on a cruise with my mom to make her feel better, and um, half the boat was Mexican, and I started hanging out with the Mexicans, and one night they got me really drunk on tequila, and I started speaking Spanish fluently, and they <laughs> said, see, you're speaking. You just thought you couldn't, so, you know, but with the alcohol, you know, it released that, that, that block, and, and suddenly I was just babbling away in Spanish, and it was all good. <laughs> Amazing. Now, how did you get interested in anthropology? Um, well, my parents were racist. They were white Southern racists. They had grown, my dad grew up in East Texas and my mom grew up in Northern Louisiana. Um, their grandparents and great grandparents, their great grandparents and great great grandparents were slaveholders. And um, they grew up in that era when Black people were niggers and, you know, no count and all of that. And we had this black maid, Obi, who would buy the food, cook the food and serve the food, but did not sit down at the table to eat the food with us. And by the time I was 15, I started wondering why she couldn't sit down and eat with us. And, um, and I started noticing that in restaurants, my parents would be super polite to white waiters but very nasty to Mexican American waiters or to black waiters. And if a car of Mexicans pulled up beside us at the stoplight, 
my mom would look over and she'd say, oh, those people, they breed like rabbits, you know? And I, and all I saw was a happy family with a bunch of kids in the back of the car, you know? And I, I, I started to get really confused. Like my parents are good Christian people. They're kind, they're compassionate, they're generous. They're, you know, somewhat religious. They go to church every Sunday. Why are they so mean to these people? And so um, I started having these fights with them about, about their racism. And I started reading in school about genocide. And, and I had been raised to be so proud of my white colonial heritage. You know, my mother was a member of the Daughters of the American Revolution and the Daughters of the Republic of Texas and um, the, um, the Civil War Daughters, uh, or Daughters of the Confederacy. Um, some of my ancestors settled in Virginia, so we belonged to the Peyton Society of Virginia. Some ancestors came over on the Mayflower. Um, <clears throat> so I was raised to be so proud of that pioneer heritage. And then I'm reading in school as a sophomore in high school about, you know, settler, settler colonialism and racism and genocide and, and the spread of diseases and by the white settlers on purpose. And I was just horrified and devastated. And, and I, my world just kind of cracked, you know, everything mm -hmm. I raised to believe turned out to be, you know, yes, they were settlers and they were pioneers and they conquered the wilderness and they cre helped create a great country but so did all the immigrants. And in doing that, they killed off, you know, millions of Native Americans. And so it, you know, I was just like struggling to, to, to figure all that out. And I started having horrible fights with my parents about it. And after one screaming fight, I ran into my room and slammed the door. And I remember leaning back up against the door and thinking, I need to run away. I can't, I can't do this anymore. Mm. And then it suddenly hit me. I had this like epiphany that my parents could not change because of the way they were brought up and how they were socialized, but that I had a choice and that I could love them and appreciate them for their good qualities, but that I did not have to be like them in that way. Mm -hmm. so I think in that moment, I became an anthropologist. Mm -hmm. And my question was why, you know, why are they like that? Why are they so, why, what is racism? Why, why do people have racist beliefs? Why can't everybody, like Rodney King said, what King said, why can't we all just get along? And so um, the first, first course I signed up for at Wellesley was Anthropology 101. And that course answered a lot of my questions about why, and I gained a much broader understanding of the world. Um, and then when I transferred to UT, when I married my husband, who was in law school there, um, <clears throat> I, I took another anthropology course with a terrible teacher, so I kind of lost interest. I was in the honors program at UT is called the Plan 2 program, where you, it's like being in an elite small college within a huge university. You get the best courses and the best professors and all of that. And so I majored in Plan 2. I didn't have to pick a specific major. Um, and I was really confused about what to do, like where to go from there, until the last semester when I got lucky enough to take a course in folklore by Barbara Cat, uh, Christian Black Gimlet. And that course, that course was what hooked me. That course was so fascinating. And so, I mean, for, for my paper for that class, I interviewed a Texas madam. I, um, we had a whorehouse here, um, a brothel for a uh, hundred years called LaGrange, called um, the Chicken Ranch. And um, so my project, I was actually uh, went to the Chicken Ranch and I interviewed the madam and I did a whole study of how her, her um, the way she told jokes and the way she verbally manipulated the, her environment kept her on top of everything and kept her, her girls safe and, and protected. And um, I wrote about it, it's on my website, it's called Landlady at LaGrange, the Folklore of a Texas Madam. And mm -hmm. that article got published in the Journal of American Folklore and was used for teaching for decades because it's full of dirty jokes that the madam told. And it's so funny how <clears throat> the jokes that w the guys would tell, <coughs> <coughs> excuse me, the jokes that the, <coughs> just a sec. The jokes the guys would tell, um, the, the man always came out on top, but the jokes that Edna would tell, the madam, were all about the, the woman always came out on top. The woman always defeated the male. 
and I would I could see by analyzing the transcripts of my interviews how she would consistently put the men down and down until she had complete control of the environment, <clears throat> which was important for me because they thought a lot of the guys that came into the whorehouse thought that, I mean, here I am, 19 years old, young, drop dead beautiful, hair down to my waist, <clears throat> and they thought I was a prospective employee. Mm -hmm. so they offered to take me back to the room, a room and try me out, right? And I was, oh my God. And that's one of the ways that she protected me by ver verbally putting the men down until they were like, kind of like that, you know? So, um, and one of the toasts that she, she loved to say was, here's to the girls of the Golden West. They've got tits like a hornet's nest. Their skin on, the skin on their pussy is tight as a drum. They've got the skin on their belly is, okay, let me start over. Here's to the girls of the Golden West. They've got tits like a hornet's nest. The skin on their belly is tight as a drum. They've got a puss that'll make a dead man come. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Just one example. And so after that, for many years, people kept sending me information about prostitutes. And I was like, no, that was just a one-time deal. I'm not, my life study is not going to be prostitutes. No. <laughs> so then you how, it... how I got into birth was um, I got pregnant with my first child. I had been uh, working for several years in Mexico doing a study of uh, two shamans there, a traditional shaman named Don Lucio and a, a very sophisticated, very upper class, very wealthy shaman named Edgardo Vasquez Gomez. <clears throat> and um, I had written my master's thesis um, about myth ritual and shamanism in Mexico, which unfortunately was lost in a house fire. When, at one point I wanted to go back and publish it, but it was in the attic when my house burned down, so it's lost forever. That was way before computers and copies and stuff. <clears throat> anyway, so I had, so it, so then I had my, my daughter Peyton, and um, she was born by a necessary cesarean, and I was devastated. You know, I, I was one of those women who went into the hospital feeling like Earth Mother and came out with a cesarean scar. And I was wounded and damaged. I had PTSD, PTSD after that experience. It took me months to recover. <clears throat> and, um, and I wanted to understand why that happened to me. This was 1979. So I started asking other women about their experiences, trying to compare. And I kept seeing this standardization in their experiences. You know, like everybody was treated in the same way, but birth was so unique for each woman. I was like, why is birth treated in such a standardized way when it's a unique process for each mother? <clears throat> and so, um, so it came time for me to pick a dissertation topic, and I went out to lunch with my advisor, Barbara Christian Black Gimlet, the same one who had taught the folklore course that so enchanted me. And um, <clears throat> she said, okay, so what's it gonna be? And I said, oh, okay, on the one hand, there's the whole myth ritual and shamanism in Mexico thing, and on the other hand, there's birth. <clears throat> and I explained about that, and she said, Shamanism, shamanism, shamanism. Everybody and their dog is studying shamanism. She said, you do women's things, you do birth. And I said, okay. <laughs> and that was a crossroads moment that set my life trajectory, you know. And I've been doing birth and midwives and obstetricians and reproduction ever since. And then your are I, I also stuck with the ritual stuff. Eventually in 2016, I published a book called The Power of Ritual with um, my colleague Charles Laughlin, and it's a brilliant, I mean, I have to say, it's a really, truly brilliant book about rituals. So I, I never lost that original interest in, in, in ritual and shamanism and myths and all of that. And now it's all there and everything I know about it is in a 450 page book that, <laughs> that's out there and available. It's called The Power of Ritual. Well, and then the, the choice, the title of your uh, book of, of uh, uh, and I'm having a, a senior moment of uh, rite of passage is is ritual is a a lost ritual in our culture and that's what I most remember when I first met you of oh wow what a great title because yeah. we've yeah, lost I, that right. I took that interest in ritual and I transmuted it into birth yeah <clears throat> because as I studied birth more and more and interviewed more and more women. <clears throat> and attended some births and watched a lot of videos. 
um, it became clear to me that standard obstetric procedures were absolutely um, non-essential and non-evidence-based. We didn't have the term evidence-based mm -hmm. for a couple decades after I started the research. But at the, even though we didn't have that word, it still became clear they were not based on any kind of evidence. They were just done on by biomedical tradition. And so <clears throat> when you can't figure out, you know, I mean, I could not figure out how doctors could be so stupid until, I mean, like, ima like, first, like imagine the baby's born and is struggling to breathe. And what's the first thing they do? They cut the umbilical cord cutting off the baby from its oxygen supply. Yeah, yeah. As long as the placenta, the cord is still pulsing, the baby's still getting oxygenated blood from the placenta. And here it is struggling to breathe and the doctors cut the umbilical cord immediately. I mean, that is stupid. There is just no other word for it. But I needed to find an explanation beyond stupid. <clears throat> so I finally realized that although in the developed world, we think that we have de-ritualized birth, that we've taken it away from all those superstitions and taboos that primitive people used to lay on birth. Um, in fact, we had re-ritualized it in the most intense series of rituals ever perpetrated on any natural process. I realized that every standard of such a procedure, from electronic fetal monitoring to episiotomies to pitocin augmentation and induction and all of that, I realized that they were all rituals that are designed, and rituals, my definition of ritual has always been <clears throat> a ritual is a pattern, repetitive and symbolic enactment of a cultural or individual belief or value. Shortly put, rituals enact beliefs and values. <clears throat> so I could see that these procedures were rituals and how they enacted our cultural belief and value on high technology and mm -hmm. on perceiving natural processes as dangerous and needing to dam up birth like you dam up a river, <clears throat> rituals have been used across history <clears throat> to, um, they, they, rituals stand as a barrier between cognition and chaos. So rituals, when you perform a ritual, it gives you a sense of control. Like if I do this ritual right, <clears throat> then I'm gonna engage some larger cosmic gear and the gods will carry me safely through the danger. And yeah. that's exactly how obstetricians use these standard procedures as rituals. They think that the more they perform them, the safer the birth is and the less likely they are to get sued or to have a, a, a bad outcome. So the rituals buffer them against their fear. They're in a, they're the fear that they've, been, that they've been socialized into in med school, <clears throat> the fear of birth, which they are taught to think of as a pathological natural process that could go wrong at any second. So those rituals that they do give them courage. <clears throat> and so I was able to answer the question of why, which is the primary question in anthropology, why do obstetricians form, perform to standard procedures that make no scientific sense and that rationally are stupid, <laughs> but, they're, but culturally they make tons of sense because they are rituals that enact our key cultural beliefs and values on the supremacy of high technology and controlling nature through technology. Brilliant. Yeah, what a great summary. <laughs> so you're, uh, you got your master's and then you went on with your, uh, you said your, your thesis was um, about birth. And this was, you're still at... Uh, Ritual and Shamanism in Mexico. And then my dissertation was Birth as an American Rite of Passage, which then it took me a year to turn that into a book. I published several articles out of it and then I made it into a book. So my first book was Birth as an American Rite of Passage, which became like, it was called a classic in the field, like a day after it was published. It was so amazing. Mm -hmm. And suddenly instead of being this, this, just this person at the anthropology meetings, I was a star, you know? <clears throat> I felt like I, it took me a long time to integrate the images. I felt like I was this walking placard that said birth as an American rite of passage because at every anthropology meeting, people would just cluster around me and tell me how much they loved my book and how it was a classic in the field. And Charles Leslie, this really famous anthropologist called it a mountain in the landscape of symbolic anthropology, you know, <clears throat> and it became the book that everybody reads and everybody cites. And if you don't cite it, it's like you haven't done your homework. So it became this huge big deal that I never, expected because when I wrote it I was just I felt like I was just singing my little song 
and hoping that maybe somebody would listen. Well, a lot of people listened, you know. What was <laughs> the year, the first year it was published? It was first published in 1992, and then it came out in a, revi a second edition in 2003. But for that second edition, all I did was write a new preface. And I've done tons of books since then. <clears throat> and, uh, and yet that remains my major contribution. So I'm completely redoing it. Um, I, by, I have to turn it in by August 2021. But um, a colleague and I have done, have, and their, her grad students have done another, another 60 interviews. That first book was based on 100 interviews that I conducted. Um, now we've got 60 interviews, um, all from people who've given birth since the year 2000. Um, <clears throat> and I'm going um, to, I'm going to completely revise and update that book based on this new set of interviews and sort of inquire and then go, you know, back to the past and forward to the future um, as I compare the editions as I, as I write. So um, the, the new and, and, and revised edition should come out in 2022. Right? Uh-huh. Uh, let's go back and, and pick up your, your personal life now. Your daughter was born uh, at what stage in your career? Were you uh, after your uh, thesis? or? Uh, no, she was born in 79 when I was still in grad school. And then I, uh, and then I, then I went to Mexico and took that year off and drove all over Mexico and Guatemala and Belize and the Yucatan and it was amazing. With her. And then um, I, that was when I was 25. And then, um, and then I came back and went back into grad school, um, fell in love, got married, <clears throat> had my daughter in 79. And then, um, and then I finished grad school um, not too long after that. And um, then I started my dissertation research. Um, and because I was raising and then I had my second child in 84 um, by a vaginal birth, you know, after a VBAC, after vaginal birth after cesarean at home. Um, mm -hmm. And that was interesting because my daughter was seven pounds and the reason given for her, her um, cesarean birth was uh, uh, cephalopelvic disproportion. Um, but my homeborn baby was 10 pounds. So, so much for my pelvis being too small. <laughs> <laughs> right. Wow. And, um, well, that must have been a struggle in those days to do a VBAC. How did you manage it that? It wasn't. I had these amazing midwives who were uh, legal in Texas at the time, but oh. forbidden to do VBAC breaches and twins. And um, they did it anyway. They just ignored, you know, they just went above and beyond for me. They were awesome, Kathy and Debbie. <clears throat> so I had this a three day labor and, um, you know, and this amazing, empowering, incredible birth experience. And, um, and then, uh, and then I, I went back to work on my dissertation and I started teaching at the University of Texas part-time. And so between raising two kids and teaching, <clears throat> it took me forever. And I finished my dissertation in 1986, two years after my son was born and uh, got my PhD in 1986. And then I remember my husband saying, okay, good, well, that's all done. I'll give you this big party, and now we can move on, and you can be my wife. And I was like, uh, no, that's not how it works. You don't get a PhD to have a PhD. You get a PhD so you can do things in the world, you know. So from then on, I taught at UT for over 20 years, and I taught uh, at other universities as well, Rice in Houston, Trinity in San Antonio. And, um, <clears throat> and I started doing more research. I, I switched from studying women to midwives after I went to my first man, MANA conference, Midwives Alliance of North America. They had me there as a keynote speaker in 1991. And I walked into that hotel in El Paso. <clears throat> and when those sliding doors opened and I walked in, it felt like I walked straight into this wall of energy that was so intense. I kind of was like, whoa. What is it? Oh my God, where does all this energy come from? And then I realized it was because nobody in the hotel wasn't a midwife. That hotel was full of 450 midwives. And oh. their energy was so intense, <laughs> so intense <laughs> that it, it just kind of knocked me over when I, when I walked in the door. And um, on Sunday of the conference, they had, I gave my keynote speech and I got a standing ovation. That was awesome. 
And then on Sunday, they had this big banquet with all these midwives sitting at round tables holding eight each. And somebody went around and said, could all of you just write down on a napkin how many births you think you've attended just informally <clears throat> so we can have the total for the room. And then when they announced the total, it was 80,000 births. Like the 450 midwives in that room had attended over 80,000 births. And even though they were attending less than 1% of births in the US at that point, still, I was blown away. I was like, I looked around and I thought, these 450 midwives have given 80,000 families the chance to have an amazing, magical, empowering, incredible, evidence-based birth experience. They do VBACs, they do breaches, they do twins. They're more skilled than most obstetricians. They're, you know, and I just fell in love with midwives in that moment. And so I switched from studying women who might already have been studying extensively for over a decade and switched to midwives. And so from then on, my research was focused on midwives. And then after that, I started to focus on obstetricians because I got very interested in them as well. Fascinating. Now, what did, this was your second husband that wanted you to um, uh, use your PhD to be a wife, better wife? <laughs> yes, yeah, and that remained a problem throughout our marriage because um, he really wanted a wife with a capital W, you know, someone who would be there for him, help him with his business, um, do his books, you know, cook, cook meals for the, for the family. And I tried, you know, to, but my heart was in my career and, and in my kids, you know, and I could not be the wife he wanted. And um, he eventually became an abusive alcoholic and it became the last 10 years of my marriage were extremely painful. He hated me for my career. He literally hated my career because it kept me from being the wife that he wanted. But he had known when he met me that that was who I was. Yeah. <laughs> so eventually he got, kept getting more and more abusive until finally I had no choice but to divorce him. And later he remarried someone who is a wife or was a wife with a capital W. And after some years of a happy marriage with her and they had another kid together, he died. Um, he had a, uh, his heart got swollen twice the size because he was an alcoholic and he drank a ton and he had a terrible diet. And so he died at the age of uh, 64, I think. And, and that was, you know, a tragedy. But for the last years of his life, he had the wife he wanted, someone who would devote herself completely to him, which just never could be me. And your, your kids, do they stay connected with him or how was that? Oh yeah, um, yeah, they, they, he was a very good father and, and my kids loved him. So it wasn't really a problem. When we divorced, um, I told my son we were divorcing and I asked him who he wanted to live with. And he said, I don't care which one of you I live with as long as I get to stay in the house. And I said, well, I get the house and the divorce. So he stayed with me, which was perfect mm -hmm. because I could mother him. I could do his laundry and feed him and you know, give him rides and stuff. Mm -hmm. But his dad picked him up all the time to go play golf or go do sports or go do the things that they had shared interest in. So it really wasn't. And by then my daughter was, you know, almost grown and off to college. So it really wasn't very mm -hmm. traumatic for the family. I hung in there for 20 years. And wow, was, 20 years. Yeah, mm -hmm. because by the time I did divorce him, the kids were old enough that it didn't traumatize them. Mm -hmm. And then uh, it's probably time to talk about the tragedy with your daughter that uh, I just read about on the, I think it was Wikipedia in the, in the story you wrote that I have, I have to admit I hadn't read, but I'm going to. Yeah, um, well, she was the light of all of our lives. She was such a bright spirit and um, um, yeah, it's been 20 years. Um, she was um, she was in New York City because she wanted to um, dance on Broadway. She had gone to college for a year and then um, decided to take a leave of absence because she said, "Mom, my dancing days are limited because, like you, I have arthritis in my knees and, and I'm only you know 20 and they're or 20, 19 and they're already cracking. So um, I'm going to go dance on Broadway for as long as I can and then I'll go back to school." And so she went to New York and she was um, 
taking classes at Broadway. She started out with Alvin Ailey, but she said that they were all just snobs and it was all about who'd been there the longest and who paid, donated the most money. And so she went over to Broadway Dance where she found her community. And um, so she was taking dancing classes there and teaching dancing classes there and working at the reception desk um, to register people and sell t-shirts and stuff. And, and then she realized, she saw that other dancers um, were wait waiting tables, you know, to get through when they weren't being hired for Broadway shows. So she said, I, Mom, I'm going to take massage therapy. I've always been interested in it. And I, if I'm a massage therapist, then I can always make, you know, 150 bucks an hour doing massages. Um, and that will support me to dance on, on Broadway. So she enrolled in Swedish Massage Institute and was close to completing that class before she died. <clears throat> and then one day she found out about Natural Gourmet Cookery Institute. And she called me up all excited. Mom, massage heals from the outside in but cooking heals from the inside out. And this is a, a group that teaches math. They teach you French, fancy French cooking, but they also teach you natural, completely organic cooking. And I wanna, I wanna go to school here. I, I'm like, Peyton, how can you possibly find time for all this? And she's like, oh, don't worry, I've got it all worked out. My dance classes are this and this, and my, you know, my Swedish massage courses are these days, and then I can do the nat natural gourmet at night, and I'll be fine, you know? So I said, okay, honey, and so we, we paid for her enrollment, and she actually had graduated from National Gourmet um, and was on, on her, she was on her way home to do a, a restaurant um, internship, which is the next step after you graduate. Her dad got her a, an internship at one of the finest restaurants in Austin, and she was driving home with her friend Kara to, um, <clears throat> to um, do that internship and she was also going to take on her dad she said mom i'm so tired of these drunken phone calls at four in the morning <clears throat> um she said i know my dad's an alcoholic and i'm i but, and i know that i'm the only person he'll listen to and i'm coming home to to do my internship and to take care of him i'm going to cook for him and clean up his diet and i'm going to make him stop drinking and i'm going to change his life and that I had been praying for years for somebody to do that because obviously I couldn't. And uh, she died on the way home. <laughs> she never made it. Um, <clears throat> her friend Kara was driving and she asked Peyton to get her some ibuprofen or something. <clears throat> so Peyton took off her seatbelt to rummage in the back for it. And um, Kara was <clears throat> looking down at the CD player to put Marvin Gaye on song 11 and she drifted off the highway <clears throat> and there was this big lip. Um, the, the concrete was about this far off the, the grass. And so <clears throat> the car twisted when she got off the highway and she, nobody had ever told her that when you, that happens, you do not yank the wheel. You steer slowly and calmly ahead till you regain control and then you go back on the highway. Instead, she freaked and she yanked the wheel and the car flipped four times and <clears throat> Peyton's body, she didn't have her seatbelt on, and her body was thrown through the windshield 50 feet down the road. Wow. And, yeah, so um, we got the news at midnight um, that night. These two people in gray t-shirts that said, Travis County Sheriff's Victims Department knocked on my door and said there was an accident in Virginia and your daughter didn't make it. And it felt like the house picked up and shifted 180 degrees and all the molecules in the air changed and life as the world as I knew it ended in that second. Mm -hmm. That has never really been the same. I am, um, we got the news at midnight and an hour later they were on the phone asking if we would donate her corneas because they were the only organs that weren't damaged when she skidded 50 feet down the highway. And at first we were going to say no, don't mutilate her further. And then I got chills and I said to my ex, I had called my ex-husband of course the second the people came in and gave me the news. And, and um, I said, Robert, can you imagine someone seeing the world through Peyton's eyes? And mm. she only saw the, the best of everything. She helped so many people. And so, um, so we did donate her corneas. And, um, and I 
We got the news at midnight and by 6 a.m. I was on the plane to Virginia where her body was because I wasn't gonna let. They said they could just, you know, uh, ship her body down in a box. And I was like, no, I, I understand that I have to integrate this experience. If no. I don't, I'll never believe that this happened. And I mean, the shock, I'm still in shock. 20 years later, there's a part of me that's still in shock and just simply can't believe this happened. So I flew up to Roanoke and I spent all day with her body. I washed her, bathed her, combed her hair, um, put my arms around her and begged for her not to be dead, even though her corneas were already gone and her eyes were sewn shut. And, um, and I... Uh, the nurse said, you know, be careful. You might want to sit down. I mean, when you see her body, it's it's really damaged. And I started to pull the sheep down slowly, and there's her beautiful forehead all untouched and, um, and her beautiful, beautiful eyebrows. And then I pulled down further, and one side of her face looked like a volcano had exploded on it, and the other was just like like Indian paint, war paint, you know, the plastic, it was so from sliding down the, across the, the asphalt. And um, they had cut open her chest. Um, I was told that the ER doctor had been, had been massaging her heart in his hands, trying to keep it beating, you know, but she was too damaged. And, and, um, <clears throat> and then as I slid the sheet down further, there were her beautiful dancer's legs and they were torqued and twisted and broken in a dozen different places. But I, I, I got to spend all day long with her. The nurse didn't rush me. My fiance at the time, Richard Jennings, came to be with me. My friend Sharon Gill came to be with me. And if I hadn't had that day with her in the hospital, I don't think I could have survived her death. Um, I don't understand how people can just go to the morgue and take a quick look and say, yeah, that's him. You know, I needed, I needed yeah. to fully integrate her death. And, um, and I'm so grateful for that time. And I would have given anything if she could have just stayed alive and conscious long enough for me to get there so I could say goodbye or say something. Mm -hmm. But at least I got to hold her and love on her and, and comb her hair and wash her and bathe her and do all those ritual things that, that I felt that I needed to do. And um, meanwhile, her dad and brother had stayed in Austin and her dad's new wife and they were amazing. They, she was coming home um, just in time for her 21st birthday. And so um, she was, we were going to have this big birthday party for her. <clears throat> so we turned the birthday party into a memorial service slash birthday party. And we knew we had to hold it on the day of her actual birthday, September 16th. So we did. They, I was up there in Roanoke being with her body and then going to see the site of the accident and see the piles of glass. And I found some stuff from her car that had been thrown out like a Japanese figurine that I had given her. And um, then I had to go get, go to her car, her totally wrecked, smashed, destroyed car and get her luggage out because we had to have clothes to dress her in for the, for the memorial service. And, um, and then, then we made the plane in time to, to escort Peyton's body home. And we were greeted at the airport by tons of friends and family who came, you know, <clears throat> and then we went around to the hangar to, and there's, you know, this box with my daughter's body in it. And um, her friends, Mayla and Orion, Rima's daughters got on the floor and put their arms around the box and just cried and said, Peyton, please don't be in there. You know, please don't be back. And, um, Anyway, we pulled off this beautiful memorial service. That was, um, it was stunning. There were about almost 500 people there. And um, we served a full meal. We had it in an outdoor sculpture garden and we served a full meal. Uh, um, we, she had sent us the menu she cooked for her graduating dinner from uh, Natural Gourmet. So we found a chef who was willing to cook exactly that menu. 
and it was delicious. And we decorated with Texas wildflowers because those were her favorite. And um, so first we had the service and um, people came up and talked about Peyton, her, her friend Brian, who had been deeply in love with her, sang this beautiful song that he'd written for her as a lullaby called Sweet Dreams. And um, which became kind of her death song, you know, sweet dreams, that's all I have to say. I know your dreams, light your way. Let the night shut your eyes, let it fill you up with light. You're not alone, good night. That was part of how the song went, beautiful. And um, um, we had videos of her dancing, uh, running in one of the rooms at the, at the venue. And um, um, so people came up and spoke about Peyton for a certain period of time, and then we broke for dinner and, you know, 150 people enjoying this fabulous gourmet dinner on the lawn. And, um, and then we, and I made really, really sure not to rush anything because what worked for me at the hospital was that that nurse, Becky, she never rushed me. She let me take all the time I needed with Peyton. So I never felt ripped away, you know, which would have been so painful. And I didn't want the memorial service to be rushed either. So we told the funeral home people, it's going to take as long as it's going to take. Her body's going to stay in that arbor until this is over. You're just going to be patient. And they agreed. And, um, <clears throat> and so I actually took time at one point to walk around and just stare at all these groups of family, friends, and relatives that had come out to honor my daughter. And... Um, and I just imprinted, you know, I still can vividly see the scene, the candlelight flicking, flickering on the lawns, the, the groups of people that came together and, to, and everybody was talking about Peyton and it was just an amazing, amazing event. And then when I was truly ready, we called everybody together and we sang happy birthday to Peyton, both in English and Spanish. Um, and then um, we sang Las Mañanitas to her and um, and then um, the pallbearers got her casket and, and, uh, and we made a kind of procession and everybody carried it out and uh, put it in the, in the hearse and it drove away. I, I put the flowers in right behind it so it was still beautiful even as it left. And, um, and then I went back to the inside and I saw, um, I saw Jason standing in the middle of this group of like 50 of his high school friends who were all giving him this massive group hug. You know, it was just an incredible experience and a, a wonderful way to honor our daughter and her, her life. <clears throat> and then two weeks later, her friends in New York, her friends who did not know each other from Natural Gourmet and from Swedish Institute and from um, Broadway Dance, they actually got together and they organized a beautiful memorial service for her in New York City in one of the parks there that they put on themselves. And we flew up for that. And that was stunning. I mean, the testimonials people gave about Peyton, what a contribution she'd made to the world. You mm -hmm. know, one woman said that girl had done more in her 20 years of life than I had done in my 40 years of life. And oh, I mean, she was also a diver, you know, a registered scuba diver and a rescue diver <clears throat> on top of being a dancer and a, and a chef and a, um, and, and a very good massage therapist. Um, she, um, so at that memorial service in New York, uh, one person said that when she had first gotten up to New York from Oklahoma to go to Swedish Massage Institute, they had a reception for new students and she said she was sitting in a corner terrified, this little Oklahoma girl in New York City. And uh, Hayden <clears throat> walked in the room, kind of looked around, ignored the people saying hello to her and went straight over to that girl in the corner and stuck out her hand and said, hi, I'm Peyton Floyd, who are you? And they sat down and Peyton and the lady said in 20 minutes, Peyton made me feel completely welcome and completely at home and like I could absolutely make it in New York. And there were so many stories that people told like that at that service in New York and at the one in Austin. So um, Peyton left a legacy in the world that no one, none, no one who knew her will ever forget. <clears throat> and many of us who didn't know her are touched by and, and thank you for the courage to share your story and the, and the wisdom of using this ritual to heal as much as you could from 
What? Well, I already stood, understood the power of rituals, so yeah. I consciously used those rituals to be yeah. create them to be as healing as they possibly could be. And how much unspoken grief and trauma is out there because people don't know, because our culture discounts the importance of ritual. And, and uh, as you said, go to a funeral home and identify the body and, and leave. It's like the cost to them emotionally over the rest of their life by not uh, completing. So thank you. Wow. Hard to share it. I did write about it, the articles on my website and it's called Windows in Space Time. I saw that mentioned, yeah. So uh, your son, Jason, is um, what, uh, what's his life been like? Are you uh, a grandmother or? Yes, my son is married to my daughter-in-law, Ashley, um, whom I totally adore. And they have two um, wonderful, they're both in their, I think Jason's 36 now. And um, my grandsons are Jackson Gray, Jackson and Grayson. So we had Peyton, Jason, Jackson and Grayson. <laughs> and um, that was all intentional. And, um, and my grandsons are six and eight now. They're both little blonde haired, blue eyed, adorable little, little boys. Just couldn't be sweeter and cuter and they're just fabulous. Are they nearby? You get to see them? are nearby and no I don't get to see them <clears throat> um, my son is angry with me and I really don't want to go into this much but I haven't been allowed to see them for two years so this is this everyone has their tragedies to bear and this one is mine I'm cut oh. off from sorry to hear that yeah now really let's go back to your cigarette now and you guys can just deal with that <laughs> yeah. uh, let's go back to your your professional history and what led up to when I met you and, and this amazing <clears throat> group of mainly women, I think all women, uh, while well, there was Jay, uh, what's his name, um, from uh, Bradley birth, but about, you know, I was one of the few men at that meeting and uh, encountered uh, a whole new world of what I later named uh, <clears throat> or consider infant wellness that was uh, so important and yet completely ignored by the, you know, I've been involved in, in wellness and holistic medicine, and yet midwifery is probably the most fundamental holistic component of a healthcare system that's been denied and, and overlooked. And, you know, I was fortunate to get a midwife for my second daughter. We had a at home underwater birth, but first one was standard obstetrician in a hospital in Baltimore. So, um, you were uh, an instant star after your first book, and then you began studying midwives and uh, your, of course, your your literary skills as an editor, and uh, which you uh, used in your um, work with the the various documents that we talked about. But how how did My you? My superpower. I've done sixteen edit, edited collections. <laughs> wow. Yeah, it's. Uh, uh, your your involvement with this uh, this amazing eclectic bunch of of women that uh, that was all new to me uh, when you came to Mount Madonna Center that, that was uh, what March of '96 I think uh, somewhere whenever the comet was it was and it was a little warmer than that it must have been more like May yeah it was May and June because we were moving to Virginia right after that. But I'm gonna stop you. I forgot to say something about that, that I said with Peyton's body that's really important. And that is that when I pulled the sheet down all the way, even though her body was torqued and twisted and mutilated <clears throat> from flying down the highway, you know, at 60 miles an hour, um, there was this ethereal, it was one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen, her dead body. It was. It was like it was there was this aura, this 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 radiance around it that was stunning, and you would think that it would have been grotesque and horrible to see. It wasn't. It was literally one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen in my life because it was radiant. It was like mm -hmm. surrounded with this golden radiant energy <clears throat> that was that was Peyton, and it, it felt like she was still there. I mean, her beauty 
even though her face was mutilated, her legs were torqued, her stomach chest was cut open and sewed back together, she was still stunningly, stunningly beautiful. I, it's um, one of those life's mysteries is how, how that could be, but that, that was my perception when I was with her wow. that whole day. What an amazing being. Well, um, what, uh, what's your current passion? What uh, keeps you going and uh, So um, my work and my career have, have always sustained me. And I thank God that I didn't do what my ex wanted and give, give, give everything up for him because now I would have nothing, right? And I, mm -hmm. I love my career. I have retired from teaching, but um, <clears throat> I just finished an edited collection called Birthing Techno Sapiens, Human Technology Coevolution and the Future of Reproduction. And um, what's cool about it is that, um, I mean, I'm the sole editor, but Beverly Chalmers worked with me very closely. And we both agreed that about half the book would be about techno reproductive things like altering the human genome and artificial gametes and you know, changing our DNA and all that. <clears throat> um, and the other half would be holistic and humanistic approaches to becoming techno sapiens. So um, the book oh. is about how techno sapiens, it, we're, that we're evolving ourselves as a new species called techno sapiens <clears throat> because we're co evolving with our technologies. And, <clears throat> and that that new species can be as organic and holistic and spiritual as it is technological. That's one of the big points of our book. So that was the fastest edited collection in history. The chapters were due on June 30th, and we, I finished it and sent it off to the editor on September 8th. So that was usually edited collections take years. And this, and all of my other ones have taken years. This one took like three months. It was just amazing. And well, so- two days ago, or a day ago. <laughs> yeah, two, two days ago, I sent it off, <laughs> yeah. And so um, now I'm working on a a special issue of Frontiers in Sociology called uh, The Global Impact of COVID-19 on Maternity Care Practices. Because as soon as COVID started happening, um, I co-authored, I lead authored a rapid response article for medical anthropology. Um, we did it, sent out a questionnaire to a bunch of practitioners to see how it was affecting their practices. And that article, we got that out within three weeks and it got over 3,600 views. And so we decided to do the special issue. And I'm now editing the articles for that. And they're coming in from all over the world um, <clears throat> about how practitioners are and women are dealing with the impact, pregnant women are dealing with the impacts. And it's, uh, it's a really sad story. It's, it's like the, <clears throat> you know, there have been many, in many humanistic inroads into the technocratic model of birth in the US and other European countries you know, doulas and partners were allowed <clears throat> and uh, the decor got prettier and um, women were allowed to walk around and eat and drink during labor and <clears throat> uh, animus and pubic shaving went away. And, um, but we still had, you know, a 32% cesarean rate and too many inductions. Well, now with COVID, doctors are reverting back to the older forms of the technocratic model where nobody's allowed to be with the laboring woman, or if anybody, it's one person. So she has to choose between her partner and her doula, which really sucks for women who need the support of both. And um, <clears throat> doulas are rethinking their role. They're moving to a virtual format, but that's like completely antithetical to the whole doula deal, yeah. which hands-on contact, and being there physically, emotionally, spiritually for the mother. Um, <clears throat> midwives are, you know, hospital midwives are watching a rapid increase in cesareans because doctors just want to minimize contagion. I mean, they use it as an excuse. We need to get them out quickly so, so we can minimize contagion. So let's just do a cesarean on everybody and let's induce everybody and let's move into, it's like they're really going back to a past yeah. that we moving away from already and making progress and now we're regressing because COVID is being used as an excuse for that regression for obstetricians to kind of circle their wagons you know and go back to the defensive obstetrics that they were practicing before <clears throat> and so hospital midwives are suffering through that plus if you look at it from the practitioner's point of view you know they have to ask themselves you know do I do am I essential enough to frontline care to put myself 
in line for getting COVID, which a lot of them have, you know, to, to, to you know, what is my level of dedication? Am I willing to risk my life and my family's health to go on attending people? And most of them do. <clears throat> and then a lot of them do get COVID and some of them die. <clears throat> and they have to wear those N95 masks and their faces are all bruised and sore, you know, that they wear them all day, every day. <clears throat> and um, and midwives, the hospital midwives are having a hard time dealing with uh, without doulas who helps the midwives as well, you know, and women are now, the incidences of obstetric violence, disrespect and abuse have gone up around the world because many women are allowed laboring without any companion at all to bear witness and having a companion limited the amount of violence and abuse that women experience. But without that there, women who are laboring alone, our, our obstetric violence rates are going, are skyrocketing, it's horrible. Violence from the the staff. Yeah, violence from the staff. You know, stress. You know that saying, "Shit runs downhill." You know, yeah. stress runs downhill too. So the OB takes out his stress on the nurse, and the nurse takes her stress mm. out on the laboring woman, or the OB takes his stress out directly on the laboring woman, and yeah. women are getting yelled at and 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 treated horribly and slapped around. And of course, that's all you know, socially structured in terms of race and ethnicity and <clears throat> discrimination and all of those things. Yeah. <clears throat> so it's a, it's a, you know, some people are finding that telehealth that everybody's moving to um, is good in a way because it gives, it empowers women. Um, like if you're on a telehealth prenatal consult, you take your own, your, you check your own urine, you take your own blood pressure, you, you're more, you're more autonomous, you're more in charge mm -hmm. of your, your health. At the same time, some doctors are using that as an excuse to keep their visits to five minutes and, oh, I see you're fine, bye, you know, and, and some obstetricians may never leave telehealth because it's easier for them than actually dealing with patients. So we, we don't know how life is going to look past COVID, but some of the legacies of COVID are going to be enduring. Yeah. The whole... Uh excuse for exerting more authoritarian control in, in so many areas. And, um, yeah. So I'm going to have to go pretty soon. Yeah. I, I, I'm just going to wrap up with any other parting thoughts or wisdom you'd like to pass on to future generations. This has been a, a wonderful uh, and, and touching uh, uh, history. So uh, what? Uh, um, I think the most, if we really want to change the paradigm, if we want more humanistic and holistic verse, the, the place where we haven't been going is um, the education of obstetricians. They, they truly don't know better. You know, they truly don't. They, in, in the United States, maybe 5% of our births, our hospital births are actually normal physiological births with no intervention and those are usually labors that happen so fast that nobody even has time to intervene mm -hmm. <clears throat> so obstetricians do not understand normal birth they don't know how to support it you know midwives do um, we need to reverse ultimately we need to reverse the ratio instead of you know obese tending 80 and 20 percent instead of obese tending 80 attending 80 percent of the births yeah attending 20 percent it has to reverse and midwives should be the primary attendants for at least 80 percent of women <clears throat> while ob should be reserved for the 20 percent that really need their care and it is that way in new zealand and pretty much in the netherlands as well so it is possible but before that can happen obstetricians need to be trained in normal birth physiology and their education needs to be completely revamped <clears throat> to not focus all totally on pathology, but also to focus on and understand what is normal birth. So the birth community, birth activists need to get into obstetric programs and universities and give talks and lectures and show videos and try to, to teach obstetricians in training <clears throat> to think outside the box, to think outside the technocratic box before they're so firmly embedded inside of it that they literally can't see outside of it. Yeah, that's true in all of medicine. I have a, a, a daughter of a dear friend who's in uh, um, osteopathic school in Las Cruces, and uh, she's aware of all this, but the pressures to uh, con 
conform to allopathic drug-based medicine. You know, she says it's incredible and all the testing, you know, you just get sucked into that. But then what are you going to do with all the surplus redundant obstetricians that we won't need? <laughs> that's the biggest problem. Yeah, yeah, well, that's true. <clears throat> Um, for something like else. They, can, they can do the oncology. <laughs> yeah. Well, we have a, a tough row to hoe still. And thank you, Robbie, for sharing so much of yourself and for what you've done and what you'll continue to do. I'm touched. And uh, it's been uh, a great pleasure to track you down after all these years of uh, actually seeing you again, even if it's only video. Real deal here. <laughs> All right. Take care. Okay, you too. Bye. Bye.